Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. Now, some people are born to sing, others perhaps are born to write great books, some are even born to be wild. And that could, I suppose, apply to my guest today. But above all, Tim Meltzer was born to cook. And here he is. Tim, thank you for joining us. Yeah, lovely. Great to have him here. Sorry? Thank you for inviting me. There you go. He's a polite lad as well, yeah? Now, Tim Meltzer is one of Germany's leading television cooks, but he's also got his own restaurant. He's written best-selling cookbooks, has won prestigious awards, and much, much more besides. I'm sure we can look forward to talking to him about the following topics. Keep it simple. A restaurant, says Tim Meltzer, should be the kind of place where he would go with his buddies before a night out. Total exhaustion. Our guest is one of many people who've suffered from burnout syndrome. So, how best to combat this widespread complaint? And golden oldies. If you're into classic or antique cars, then this is your time of year because the classic car fair season is just getting underway. Tim, first question. Um, what is the average amount of money that a, a German family of four needs or needs to cook an evening meal or has to cook an evening meal? You mean the amount of money? Yeah. Um, as far as I know, um, it's 12 euro 43 pence for four person for one meal. 12 euros 43. So we're talking somewhere 15, 16 dollars, something like that. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. I learnt this figure from you, and you know where I learnt it from. I learnt it from your program, your TV program. Yeah. Which Just I tell did, us yeah. a little bit, bit about the format of your of, of your show. Um, at the end of the day, I'm a television chef. Yeah. Beside, I've got, I'm a professional chef as well. I own my own restaurant, yeah. and I don't try to behave as a professional chef in my show. I yeah. want to teach the people what to cook at home, which is completely different to what I do in my restaurant. And how to cook on a small budget. Same, because um, like when you talk to people who are not into cooking, like me, yeah. for me, I, I'm, I'm, I wake up and I think cooking and I think eating, I think food. But for a normal average person, there are two pro problems, which is the time. If you have got a proper job, you, you come home like somewhere six o'clock in the evening, you don't want to stand, Tell me about it. stand I know the like, problem. <laughs> like two or three hours in the kitchen. For me, it's, it's fun, but for other people, it's like a bit stress. Mm -hmm. So I try to keep the time of preparation for the food quite low, mm -hmm. and even the money, because average income is not as high as we sometimes pretend it is. You can't buy the best uh, organic food, uh, the, the imported uh, Italian cheese, uh, the, the expensive ham from Spain or the fish from Norway. You just have to buy the stuff in from the supermarket, and that's why I try to make quite attractive to the people at the, in the audience. So, the, And the programme is called Tim Meltzer Cooks, and it's, it's, it's very spontaneous. You cook, you cook the whole meal for four people in half an hour, more or less. Yeah? More or less, yeah. More or less, yeah. Less, you know, <laughs> television is uh, okay. the most but honest. There's a lot of spontaneity in it. This breaks all the rules of haute cuisine. Some, somehow it does. Of course, when I start off into the, in, into the show, I've got a recipe in my head, but because I don't like recipes, I'm, I'm quite spontaneous doing the cooking, I'll, I'll always change it while I'm cooking. So if I see the tomato and the tomato is not ripe enough or so, so I change a little bit the ingredients to make it a bit more interesting or mm -hmm. so. Or, of course, I forget, a, um, I'm, I'm talking, I'm cooking, I talk to the audience, I talk to the camera, I have to get, give some information as well. And because of this, I forget a lot of things. Um, especially ingredients, so at the end of the show. <laughs> at the beginning, I had like 10 ingredients in the recipe. At the end of the show, I have like four ingredients in the, in the recipe. Now, let me tell you, folks at home, it, it, it all works, I can guarantee you, because... No, I tried it out. I did his chili con carne recently, and it, it worked. It was good. My family liked it. It wasn't expensive, and it was quick. <laughs> When we were watching that report, they described you as an enfant terrible. You said, you're not that bad, yeah, no. which is quite interesting. And then they said, on the report, they said, uh, Jamie Oliver is a role model for yeah. you. And I said, is that OK? You said, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, because he, he impressed me a lot. I, uh, since I'm doing, like, media cooking and, like, mm -hmm. television cooking, yeah. I met quite a lot of people who are standing in the public and, and earning the money with public, but don't care about what they receive mm -hmm. and what they can do good to the society okay. back. Yeah. And as far as I know, Jamie, and I know him quite well, I know he's really convinced about what he's doing and re he's really concerned about he's what he's doing. And, and, and he gave me some, um, some, some motivation yeah. to, to do my own projects as well. 
So that's what I learned from him. Yeah. And you started off, you two guys were working together, training together at the Neil Street restaurant yeah. in London, the legendary restaurant. Yeah. Yeah. And there's one person who played a very important role for you, your mentor, Gennaro Contaldo. Yeah. Tell me about this gentleman. Um, when Jamie and me, we started more, more, more or less the same time at the Neil Street restaurant, and we were both at the beginning of our kitchen career, so we didn't have a clue about anything. You didn't have a clue? <laughs> no, not, not at all. I mean, Jamie just left the uh, uh, university. I, I had worked for half a year in the kitchen yeah. and uh, but we were we had good fun times in the restaurant yeah. and we had Gennaro and Gennaro gave us all these this this passion the feeling for food for for ingredient for the way of cooking for the Italian mentality in our cooking yeah. that's why me and Jamie are quite similar in the way of cooking because yeah. it's not about like the exact recipe it's about a feeling like this, it's Gennaro he's a guy and, and he won't he is very positive, but he's an Italian mama. The way he's cooking, he's, he's you know, he, he got the same big bum as a mama, and he's doing pasta very nice, and we had food, we were, it's a, it's a very touchy way of cooking, which he taught us. Yeah. And he clearly was somebody who was a very caring, sharing boss and mentor yeah. at that time. I've got a quote from you, you say, I can't stand bullies in the kitchen. Exactly, that's why I call myself a kitchen bully. <laughs> um, it's more or less now. I used to work at the Ritz Hotel before in London, and ah. um, we had a. We always called. I, I, I won't call his name now because maybe he's lo looking at this show. <laughs> uh, but we call him always a pen pusher. It was a guy with a white jacket on, and he always gave us bollocking from the morning to the evening. Yeah. And he went like la 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 la. But yeah. he gave us bad names. He treated us not very nice. And we were a good team all together. And after half a year, I wanted to co quit cooking cause of this because I couldn't stand the atmosphere. Yeah. I said like, where's the reason? and behaving like this when you make it such a beautiful topic as cooking. OK, but you do things spontaneously. You've got a reputation as being a little bit of an anarchist. But in a, I mean, in a kitchen, like at your, you've got a big kitchen at yeah. your new restaurant, yeah? You have to have structures. You have to have a hierarchy. Yeah, or you have to have a very good kitchen chef. Yeah. Which I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so you are the anarchist. <laughs> I, I am, even in my, my company. I don't have a key for the restaurant. I don't have an office in my restaurant. I don't have a computer in my restaurant. I have nothing. So if, if you check me out, out of my restaurant, I can leave in, in, within 10 minutes. I have to, to grab all my stuff, my personal stuff, yeah. which is like a kicker table, which is like a stereo, <laughs> which is like a lot of cookery books, of course. But I think my, the good thing where I'm good at is like creating an atmosphere and, 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 and sure. think for people. Like when you come in with your wife, I make you a special evening, a yeah. different evening to like for, for a group of, of girls who have a hand night. Do you? Yeah, hand night. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I will treat them different than I will treat you. And that's what my, my quality of being a, a chef is. I will cook different food. Like at four o'clock in the morning, you eat different food sure. than at eight o'clock in the evening. Like when you're, when you're drunk on the Reeperbahn, which is a red light <laughs> district in Hamburg, you don't want to have a turbot with caviar. You want to have like a sausage and some greasy stuff and some, and that's what I'm doing. Okay, folks at home, you know where to go next time you're in Hamburg. Yeah, Tim Meltzer's restaurant up there. Check it out. You'll find it on the internet, I'm sure. Now, we're in another comparison with Jamie Oliver, Tim Meltzer has uh, dedicated a lot of energy to getting kids into the kitchen, and as we see now, getting kitchens into schools. Touching, smelling, tasting. Cooking is a social activity and an education for the senses. That's why Tim Meltzer volunteers for the project Cooking for Germany Schools. Together with a charity foundation, a kitchen fitter, and the Federal Ministry of Food and Agriculture, headed by Ilse Eigner. <laughs> this Berlin primary school got a new kitchen in 2009 as part of the pilot project. After that, schools across Germany were given the chance to apply. Melza is a favorite guest. We've taken some bananas and sliced them, and then we put them in the freezer. You can do that with other fruit as well, strawberries, raspberries, plums and mangoes. For the celebrity chef, part of the fun is interacting with the children, who are an enthusiastic and curious audience. Nutritional profiles, vitamin content. For Meltzer, those are incidental benefits. Most of all, the food has to be fresh, healthy, and delicious, like this banana ice cream. The winners of the first 100 school kitchens will be decided in March 2001, and then the competition will enter its second round. Tim, tell me a little bit more about what the kids say. Um, 
the project is about like we, we build in kitchens in schools so they can work in the kitchen, they can make, um, how do you say, lessons. Yeah. Yeah, lessons, yeah, sure. Unterricht, lessons yeah, yeah, in the sure. kitchen. Lessons. And beside that, they will get in contact with food. Yeah. It's not about healthy nutrition or anything. It's just like get your hands into the kitchen, make your own, like a squeezed tomato salad, make your own dough for, for pizza, make your own banana ice cream and just, just get in contact. And what for me is very special is that I learn more from the children than they learn from me. Oh, yeah. Because uh -huh. they don't say, they, they've never said to me anytime it's wrong or it's right. They're very curious about, they, they don't have like a left or right, they, they always start at the beginning. So sometimes they mix things together where I always thought like since years, no, it can't work really. For example, we, there was one picture with pasta, spaghetti and cold water. Yeah. And as far as I know, and as far as you will ask every Italian person, you have to put the pasta in the hot cooking, <laughs> boiling water. Yeah. They make it completely different. They make it cold water, chuck the pasta inside, wait it five minutes longer, and the perfect uh, the, the pasta were it came out okay. Perfect, yeah. more than al dente. There you go. And and <laughs> and sometimes they they combine ingredients where I thought no 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 you can't do this, yeah. but because I just want to get them into the kitchen without any like verbote. There, there's, there are no rules. There's there no, no rules. there's no can't do. No, no yeah? it's, it's just emotion going into the kitchen. Sometimes they they combine uh, products where I said no. No chance at all, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, yeah. But sometimes it's, it's the food is bad as well, <laughs> so, but they have good fun doing it, which is more important than, I mean, tasty food. And we're talking boys and girls? Of course. It happens uh, to many people in many professions. It can come slowly or very quickly. It's the e acute form of emotional exhaustion that we call burnout syndrome. Tim Meltzer knows precisely what I'm talking about here, but before we hear from him, we have this report. She wants to talk about her physical and mental breakdown, but prefers to stay anonymous. For many years, this burnout patient worked in a responsible position for a major company until she hit the wall. I couldn't get out of bed. I was tired all day. I was tired at night, but I couldn't sleep. Her doctor diagnosed burnout. She was so exhausted that her doctor sent her for a two-week stay in the hospital. But after that, she wasn't able to return to work. She began psychotherapy to try to understand how she drove herself to the point of collapse. These are people who have high standards professionally as well. They expect a lot of themselves, hold themselves to a high standard of performance, and they often have difficulty putting this into practice at work. Many sufferers share another trait as well. At a certain point, I forgot how to set limits. With physical activity, burnout patients learn how to be aware of their body signals and their emotional responses and learn how to tell when they're reaching their limit. And burnout patients also need to learn how to relax. Doctors can help treat burnout patients, but employers can do a lot to keep burnout from happening. It's important that everyone who works, in whatever position, experiences appreciation for their work, that their efforts are recognized. This burnout patient has learned new coping strategies, but she knows it'll take time and patience to recover her health. Tim, uh, burnout syndrome, as I understand it, it can creep up on you very, very slowly or it can come right in, hard and fast. That yeah. was what happened to you. Um, I mean, it creeped into me, but I didn't recognize it. Okay. So, yeah. and, and the, um, the diagnosis? The diagnosis. So the diagnosis uh, came quite quite fast. Uh, yeah. I, I was doing a show yeah. and I had a nervous breakdown. In the middle of a show. In the middle of a show, so we had to cut it down, mm -hmm. and then the, the the ambulance came. That must they... be very frightening. You 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 were suddenly you were in a public situation. Yeah. And then suddenly you're in this in this private catastrophe. Yeah. Came came up to me, and then the the um, ambulance came, and they made me fit again. They gave me some some two or three injection with vitamins and stuff like this, yeah. and I could finish the show. Yeah. And after then, I made made a cut and went for six weeks into a hospital, and um, yeah, and try to make it better now. What did they tell you when you were in hospital? That I have to calm down. I'm 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 a person who's really like engaged. If if I like 
things to do. I, I like to learn and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not like 20, 30 or 40 percent. I'm al almost 100 or 110, whatever I do. Yeah. When, uh, when I'm working, when I, even, even in my spare time, I'm 100 and 110 percent. Mm. So, and I have to calm down a bit. And, and it's like a thing of behavior. Mm. So, and this is what, what makes it very hard. You don't have to be embarrassed if you have a burnout. You don't have to be embarrassed uh, if, you, if you don't feel very well or if you think you're mentally uh, tired or anything. It's the best thing. If you, if you can recognize it for yourself. It's well, so, so what signals should I be looking for? It's quite hard because every burnout is different. Burnout mm. is not like like a like a like a like a sneeze or anything. It's like every personal situation is different. Yeah. Uh, for me, it's it's when. For me, it's always I, I can recognize it's like when I I'm tired. But I even work more. That's that's my my system. So mm -hmm. I'm getting tired. I, I don't go to bed. I said no. I'm getting rid of the tiredness and, and was within working. So I get another project, and then and that's how it works with me. So yeah. and this time, the last time when I had it, um, it was a bit with drinking as well. So yeah. I tried to relax, but I couldn't relax no more. I couldn't sleep at all. Um, so I tried to get a little bit drunk and and to to calm down a bit, and which of course doesn't work because alcohol harms your body. Yeah, sure. So at least there was no relaxation at all. It's very brave of you to actually talk about it. I have to say, it's very commendable because you, uh, clearly it's important for you to break down the taboo yeah, about this. Yeah, but it's this. nothing I have to, to, to mir vorwerfen. You, you, say. you don't have to blame yourself. I have to, don't, don't have to blame myself because it's, it's, I, would have, I would have to blame me if I didn't change my life. But I did change. I always say it's a, the worst thing ever happened to me because the feelings you have in, your, in, in, in yourself are very bad and very harmful. But it's the best thing as well because my quality of life changed completely. Stupid question, we don't have much time, but, but just to, how do you relax now? Um, I like driving cars, ah. serious. I, <laughs> I travel with my car and I like traveling. Yeah. I, I have a farm in, in Spain now where yeah. I do a little bit of gardening and stuff. Yeah. Not, not really, um, what do you say? Um, not serious stuff. Not serious stuff. I yeah. bought myself a tractor yeah. and now I ruin my, 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 my landscape. I like, like traveling with my tractor around my landscape. OK, uh, we've heard it. One way that Tim relaxes is that he gets behind the wheel of his favourite car. We'll have more on that in a moment. Uh, I just want to say that uh, Tim is one of tens of thousands of people here in Germany who collect, repair and drive what they call here old-timers in English classic or antique cars. And, of course, they need spare parts. When grown men get as excited as children, chances are cars are involved. Vintage car fairs like this one in Rostock are especially popular in the spring, right before the driving season gets underway. But amateur experts are a tough audience, even when it comes to treasures like this 1965 limousine. This needs to be put in order. Some cleaning and a bit of shine on the engine. That's what's missing. Manfred Krüger knows what he's talking about. After all, he worked in a garage for 50 years. He's retired now, but he still enjoys everything that has to do with cars and engines. He restored this 1952 Barkas himself, and it's a true collector's item. They installed a Wartburg engine and made this the first private automobile in East Germany. All the other models came after that. Meanwhile, other car fair visitors are still on the hunt. We're all looking for something. Replacement parts, that's what we're after. What is a snake? This isn't junk. It's a BMW frame, which could be restored. And then it'd be a lovely little car again. He says it's a siren. I say it's a shoebox. The vendor says he'll demonstrate it, which somewhat proves his point to a skeptical audience. <coughs> On the search for bargains and rare treasures and enjoying the sights. Vintage car fans in Germany are looking forward to the driving season.
There was a lot of lovely old cars yeah. from East Germany there, yeah, some very, very nice models. We were talking while we were watching that report about the various cars that you have. And the one that interests me most, let's have a look at some photos of this one and perhaps you can tell us about it. Let's see if they're going to come up here there. Tell us about that, Tim. Yeah, with my 68 <laughs> Mustang Fastback. 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 What's a fastback? What does that mean? It means it's not a coupe, not cut off. I see. Like it it's, has the it's sloping. Ex exactly. Back. It's the original car from um, Bullet, from Steve McQueen, from the movie, one of, of my course. most yes. favorite movies. Yes. That's the raw model for it. Yeah. And um, I love this car because I treat it very badly. It's not. I'm not like one of the fuzzy Sunday drivers. Yeah. Um, my car doesn't have a garage. It's standing outside in the on German the weather on in the Hamburg. streets. It rains five, a lot in Hamburg. It rains, it snows, it freezes. <laughs> it's since five years. Yeah. And I've never, ever had any problem with it. None at all. I had to call the ADAC one time only because I ran out of petrol. Okay. But it's my favorite car. I love to drive around with it. It's, yeah. I love the sound of the VH yeah. engine. And, Top uh, speed? Not very fast, but very loud. <laughs> this one is not very fast. And it's, so of it course, doesn't it's, race, but it roars. Yeah? yeah, exactly. I mean, this is one of the cars for, you know, just drive smooth around. But in this year, in October, for example, I go to the Pan American in Mexico. Really? Uh, with a Mustang. I mean, the, and how are you going to get the car across there? Um, by, by ship. You're going to ship it across yeah, there? Yeah, yeah? Of we, we build it up at the moment in Hanover. Yeah. And then I will do like a one-week race, is it, around about like 3,000 miles. And it's a 68 Mustang, but coupe. Wowie zowie, yeah. yeah. Uh, interestingly, though, you've got all these cars, yeah, all over the place, and you've got your tractor in Spain, but you yeah. didn't, you, you've just turned 40. You didn't actually get a driving license until you were 29 years old. Yeah, because I was too stupid at the beginning to drive. <laughs> I've got the problem with a, with a Schleifpunkt, we call it, yeah. when, when you let come the, oh, the clutch. You the clutch, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so my driver, uh, driving teacher, mm -hmm. he always go to me to the parking house with me. So the first <laughs> so multi-story car park. Exactly. Car park, the, right? the first four hours, I went in the parking house, like up, down, up, down, and said, <laughs> "Where's the sense?" And I stopped it. And after then, I had to always girlfriends with cars. And but you got there in the when end. You, were 18, you got there in the end, yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you're 18, most of the time you're not allowed to drive anyway because of the booth. Correct. Yeah. Uh, Tim, we've got to wrap up. We're getting towards the end of the show. The quick quiz, quick questions, quick answers, please. Yeah. Is cooking an art or attitude? Attitude. Recipes or experimenting? Experimenting. Fast food or slow food? Slow food. Anarchy or hierarchy in the kitchen? In the kitchen, it's... Hi hi how do you say it? Hierarchy. Hierarchy. <laughs> hierarchy. Who cooks better, the English or the Germans? Definitely the Germans. Oh, it's all sure. wrong, it's all wrong. No, no, yeah, he's been a good guest today, apart from no, that one. Serious. A great cook, a great guy. If you've enjoyed his company, <laughs> apart from that comment, as much as I have, <laughs> come back next week. Until then, tschüss. <laughs>